Well, good morning. Very excited to be uh, speaking with y'all, uh, speaking to y'all this morning. Uh, very excited to serve with y'all this summer. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I've already had a really good first couple weeks, and I think it's going to only be getting better. Um, if you have your Bibles this morning, I invite y'all to turn to John 20. John 20, we're going to be picking up in uh, verse 19. And while y'all are turning, I just want y'all to think on this question with me, and that is, what does it mean to live sent? What does it mean to live sent? This word, live, living sent, lives living sent, may be something that we are unfamiliar with, the phrase at least. I think we are all aware of the concept as it's depicted in the Bible. In Genesis 12, we see that God sends Abraham to go live in Canaan so that he may be a blessing to all families. We see in Exodus 3 that God sends Moses to deliver his people, Israel, from slavery. In Isaiah 6, we see God send Isaiah to preach and to prophesy to Israel, a people that won't listen. All the rest of these books explain and tell of how these men live their lives in view of God's mission. This morning, as we study John 20, 19 through 23, we're going to see what it means to live sent, living out God's mission every day for his purposes. But we're not only going to see what it means, but we're going to see what it looks like, how we actually do that. And we're going to find that, that in Jesus' death and resurrection, that we can declare a message of peace, that we, know, that we must live our lives in loving submission to God, and that in order to do these things, we must be living with the Holy Spirit. Before diving in, though, we need to remember the context of what's going on. Jesus has just been crucified and resurrected, and he has appeared to Mary. And we also see that John just beat T Peter to the tomb. But yet, they are still in hiding. They are still fearful of the Jews. And now we see, as you pick up in John 20, that, that Jesus is about to appear to his disciples for the first time. It is a moment, for the first time after his resurrection, it is a moment of rejoicing, of wonder, and important instruction. Join me here in reading in John twenty nineteen. Now, when it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were together due to the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he had showed them both of his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he said, when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. But if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to go to church, Father, and to fellowship and to worship you together. Lord, we thank you for your word and that you allow us to read about you and to learn about you, how we can live for you and to share your gospel. Father, I ask that as we just go through John today, that, that you open our minds and our hearts to you, Lord, that we are willing to listen and willing to change according to your word. Father, as we just leave this place, keep us safe, Lord, but also give us, give us chances to share the gospel and help us to live for you. Lord, we just thank you and we love you. As we humbly pray in Christ's holy name, amen. So what does it mean to live sent? It means that we are declarers of peace. And we see this in verses 19 and 20. And then we start off with, we see that the disciples are cowering in fear. Their door is shut. It's kind of implied that it's locked. And they're worried that the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, are going to kill them. It is when this point that Jesus comes and appears to them that he says, Peace be to you. Now this is not the same as when Jesus, as when an angel appears to someone and they say, and they say Fear not. Nor is this Jesus just greeting his disciples or saying hello, but instead Jesus is making a profound life-altering life -altering declaration, and it is centered around an Old Testament understanding of peace. In the Old Testament, uh, the word for peace is shalom. And why I say that is because, one, it's a fun word to say, 
but shalom has a great weight on it. Whenever God uses this word, he means that something is complete, that something is whole, or something is perfect. So throughout, this, throughout the Old Testament, we see that God uses the word shalom to communicate his salvation, to tell of his love and mercy, to tell of his removal of judgment and, and hope. We see this, this idea in Isaiah 9, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthi with content. But later on, he will make it glorious by the way of the sea and on the other side of Jordan, the Galilee of Gentiles. People who walk in a great darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You will multiply the nation. You will increase their joy. They will rejoice in your presence and with the joy of harvest as people will rejoice and they will, when they divide the spoils. For you will break their yoke of burdens. Oh, I'm sorry. And they will break, break the yoke of burdens and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors at the battle of Midian. For every boot on the marching, of the marching battle will, will roar and the cloak rolled in blood will be burning for the fuel of its fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and on the government will, his, will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with, right, with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the army of the lords will accomplish this. We see that during this time that Israel was, being, uh, was about to be captured and enslaved and put to exile by Babylon. It was fear and terror, but Isaiah reminds them, and Isaiah tells them that you will experience peace, and it is become, because of a coming son, a coming child, which is Christ. When Jesus says, peace be to you, he is not saying peace. But instead, he is telling his disciples, God's salvation, God's blessing is with you. And the salvation, this deliverance that you have been hoping for, is now here. But where, where is this peace found? We see that this amazing peace, this divine peace, is found in his hands and in his side. Verse 20, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. The peace that Jesus gives to us is rooted in His crucifixion and is rooted in His resurrection. Jesus' sufferings on the cross, the, the whippings of the cat of nine tails, the, the, the thorns that are this big shoved into His head, the, the nails in His hands and feet, is what has provided us peace. It is Him raising again that marks the end of sin's oppression, that, that marks the ends of Satan's attacks, that takes away death's sting. This is peace. It is, this is, whenever Jesus says, peace be with you, He is only confirming what He said on the cross. It is finished. Peace be with you. We must be declarers of peace. This is our message. It is the gospel of Christ. This is what we can proclaim. Whenever we say, whenever we are telling peace to others, we're just not talking about a pleasant mental state. We're just not talking about having a, a calm, a calm good day. We're not talking about having polite relationships between people or nations. Whenever we say peace, we are talking about the eternal reign of God and His redeemed people over sin and death. This is what we must declare to others. And this is what Christ sends us to do, to be declarers of peace. But how are we supposed to go about this? How are we supposed to go in peace, go declare peace? Verse 21 tells us, So when Jesus said to, this, said to them again, Peace be to you. Just as the Father sent me, I also send you. We are to go in loving submission to God. We see that Jesus says again, uh, reiterates what he already said, that to be a message of peace. But we also see that we are drafted into the mission of God. We are to go just as Jesus went. And Jesus left heaven. Jesus lived a life, a perfect life, and died on the cross 
in loving submission to Christ. To, be, to better understand this, let's look at the relationship between the Father and Son. John 5.19 says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something that He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does in that matter. We can learn a few things about how we are to conduct our lives from this. First, we see that we are to no longer live for ourselves, but for God. We are to give up our dreams, our aspirations, our comfort and securities to better follow His will. And this seems really drastic. I mean, let's be honest. We're told all of our lives to pursue what you want, to, to, to get the job, whatever you want, to get the dream house. But yet yeah, this is not what Christ did. Think of Jesus who willingly left heaven, willingly leaving all his comforts and securities there. I couldn't imagine wanting to, like, you know, imagine getting to heaven and God says, all right, I got something for you to do, but you're going to have to go back to this place of sin and pain and sorrow. I'll be honest, I would be hard. it would be challenging for me to be like, yep, you got it, Lord. But Christ said, Christ not even knowing, not even experiencing this world, willingly left. He willingly went through life, giving up his comfort, his, his goals, his dreams. We see that whenever um, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying, Lord, please take this cup away from me. But whatever happens, may your will be done. While Jesus did not want to go through the pain of the cross, He willingly went through it for us. We must be willing to give up ourselves, to give up our comfort, our time, our securities, our uh, dreams, our goals, so that we can better further God's will. Next, we see that we are to imitate or reflect God's character. This means that we've got to put off our sinful habits, the sins that we keep going back to, that we have problems with, that we struggle with. As we will see here in a second, He has given us the Holy Spirit to give us strength. He has made a way for us to overcome sin of our, of our daily sins. If we continue to go throughout our lives and, not, and put no effort to uh, stop sinning, and let me just make a little disclaimer. One, we are, one, we are called to not sin. We do have to have the, just the honest expectation that, well, we are going to sin because we are still human and we still live in this fallen world. But we need to commit ourselves to God not to sin. But if we put no effort in and we just go about our lives just as so, I think we're going to find it hard-pressed, be really difficult to represent God and represent His character, His message, if we're just living as if the message of peace doesn't exist. If we live like the gospel doesn't exist and isn't real, how are we going to share it with others? We must represent God's character. We must represent His message. And lastly, we must be entirely dependent upon God. John uh, 14, uh, 10, Jesus says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me, he does, does, he does speak. We see that our life and our message must solely come from God, which this requires us to spend time in the Word, to spend time in prayer, seeking Him out to know, well, you know, how am I supposed to live dependent on God? Well, let's, go to, let's read through John and see how Jesus did it, and we can get a better idea from there. We are supposed to live in loving submission, loving God and putting ourselves under Him and living according to His will. However, we can't declare peace and we can't lovingly submit to God on our own. We have to have the Holy Spirit. We must be living with the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Does this verse remind you of anything? I, was, it's this, I, it's, I, I love this. This is exciting. Uh, Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed man out of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living person. The disciples were now living beings because Christ breathed the Holy Spirit into them. They now have the holy breath of God residing within them. Um, whenever Ezekiel was having the vision of the valley of the dry bones, just empty, barren valley full of thousands of bones from just dead people. 
he heard God say this in chapter, in chapter 37, verse 9. Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, The Lord God says this, Come from the four winds, breath, and breathe on these slain, so that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath entered them. And they came to life and stood on their feet, an, extre- an exceedingly great army. The disciples were slain in their sin. They were slain to death. And whenever Christ breathed on them, they received life. They were new beings. We are witnessing right here an act of recreation, where something that was alive is now dead, but now because of Christ, they are alive again. Yet we also can experience this too. We don't have to for the Jesus to physically breathe on us, but whenever we put our faith and our trust in, in Christ and ask for forgiveness, we too have the Holy Spirit enter us, and we are living beings. It is the Holy Spirit that enables us to be declarers of peace, to go out and share the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit that enables us to live in loving submission to Christ. But we have to be careful not to view it as something as a means to an end. We cannot view the Holy Spirit as something, as a way to try to get what we want, as a way to try to get God's attention, as a way to try to get our prayers answered. But instead, the Holy Spirit is someone that we get to commune with, that we get to dwell with, that we get to spend time with, to fellowship with. Whenever we are spending time with the Holy Spirit, we are spending time with God, the triune God. The Holy Spirit is not something we use to try to justify whatever we mean. That, you know, I I don't know if you've heard this. In college, at Shorter, being a a Christian university, I've heard this a lot. Well, I just feel God's telling me to date this person. Or I feel God's telling me to go do this and go do that. Well, is it biblical? Is it, is, are you using this Holy Spirit as a way to try to justify what you want? Or are you spending time with Him, listening to Him, seeing Him in the Word, praying? And actually being led this way? Or is it something that we're trying to use to get what we want? We must spend time with Him. We are fellowshipping with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must live with Him. Now, we may be saying that um, this is great. This is really cool. But Owen, I thought in Acts the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. How does this happen? And let me tell you, this is, it's, I don't know, it's kind of complicated. It made my hurt, head hurt a little bit when I was reading up on it. Whenever we're talking about the author Luke and the author John, we're talking about two different perspectives here, two different people. Luke is focused on being a, histori- a historicist, a historical person. He wants to write everything to a T. He wants everything to be in consecutive order. That's what he says in, first, in Luke 1, I think Luke 1, 3. He says that I'm writing you this in consecutive order. While John, he's a theologian. He's not exactly all concerned about the chronological details, just the theological, the big truths that represent Jesus. We see this in John 1 where he doesn't talk about Jesus' birth. He gives this really rich 18 verses about in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. This rich theology. John, Luke and John are talking about the same event but from two different perspectives. That's how we can know that these are talking about the same event This is the same truth, but a different perspective, but both are biblical. But regardless of we're talking about uh, how John describes the Holy Spirit coming down from a theological perspective, or we're talking about how Luke talks talks about the Spirit coming down from a historical perspective, they are both, it is both about God sending His Holy Spirit, His holy breath, to give life to His people. And because of that, we can live in fellowship and declare His message. This requires us to spend time in prayer, to spend time in meditation where we sit and reflect on God's Word and just quietly listen. This requires us to search God's words and to do other spiritual practices such as fasting. It is as we grow closer to the Holy Spirit that preaching His message and living in submission to God becomes clearer, becomes easier, because we are enabled to do so. We see in these three verses, that, that these four verses, that the entirety of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is concerned about missions. 
is concerned about people sharing the gospel. And they are all involved in sending you to go out and to share his message. We see that, that it is that we see the Son's message of peace. We see the loving submission to the Father, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Our God is 100% committed and devoted to sharing the gospel. And so should we. And we see this even clearer in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now let's be honest, that's a confusing verse. Are we, it, it makes it sound like that, wait, I'm supposed to forgive someone's sins? No, that's not what Jesus is getting at here, but a good question. Whatever Jesus is talking about here, we're seeing that we are being drafted into the business of grace. We don't, one, we don't have the power or the authority to forgive someone's sins. That's not what Jesus is giving us. But he is making us a part of the process of someone having their sins forgiven. Let me, let me read uh, Romans 10, 14. I think this will help us out. How are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in someone whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Our role in God's business of grace, in God's business of forgiveness, is to share the gospel. If people, how can people come to know Christ if they don't know? If no one explains to them who God is as creator and deliverer of, of the lost, how, can we, how will they not be saved if they don't know what sin is and the death that it causes? How will they know who to ask for forgiveness to if we, can't, if we don't explain who Christ is and who died for their sins? We must share the gospel. It is just an imperative. It is a part of our lives. Just as we emphasize reading the Word is important, reading prayer is important, so is, so is sharing the gospel. It is not something that is uh, one for the, goody, for the best of Christians, but it's a responsibility we all get to bear. We all get to participate in. People will not, we will see that, uh, that our role is involved with sharing the gospel so that forgiveness happens. But we also see a, like a really just a hard phrase. Uh, he, Jesus says, if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. If any of one's sins is kept, they're kept. If this still means that they are going to hell and that they are living in a place eternally separated from God. It's a weighty call that we get to live out, how we get to structure our lives, our jobs, our families, our interests around sharing the gospel. Because if we aren't sharing, who is going to be sharing? It is us, his people, who get to share. But we don't have to be just super anxious and nervous about sharing the gospel. Guys, we have God the Creator, the one who delivered His people from slavery, the one who delivered His people from death on our side. We have the Son, we have Christ who, who died for us, who conquered death. If we, if we are on the side of who conquered death, it should be easy for us to speak peace into those who are still living to it. We have the Father who has created all things just by the word of His mouth on our side. And we have the Holy Spirit that gives us empowerment. We need to be like the parable of the, the sower where, where Jesus talks to this man who goes throughout life and he's just throwing seeds. He throws it carelessly. He doesn't care where it goes. He throws on the path where the birds gets it. He throws it when the dry soil where the sun scorches it. He throws it where the thorns, where the, uh, thorns choke it out. And he throws it on the fertile soil where the, where the uh, seed grows and becomes a, becomes a sprout. We should throw carelessly. We should share the gospel with everyone, regardless of what ears. We shouldn't be nervous of, oh goodness, I hope this person listens. We should still try to share. We should still try to go in and share the, and have this conversation with them. We are to live sent this morning. Are you, are you using your life to share the gospel the, where you work at, where you spend time with your family, where you go relax? Are you using this strategically to share the gospel, thinking about, okay, I know this co-worker who just, just doesn't follow God. 
how can I ask a question? How can I uh, int- interject a topic that may, um, that may help me get to a gospel conversation? And you know, shout out, on Sunday nights, this Sunday night, we're starting a new series on apologetics that's about defending the faith, defending Christianity. Knowing apologetics makes it, real, makes it easier to help, start, to help share the gospel. Because some people ask some hard questions like, you know, if God is so good, how is there evil? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about. So, if you all want to know some more tactics in sharing the gospel, come tonight. That was a shout out. But, we are to live sent this morning. We are to be declaring Jesus' message of peace, the gospel. We need to be putting ourselves under God and loving Him and following Him in submission. We are to be living by the Holy Spirit. Are you doing these things this morning? This is the mark, this is the responsibility of the Christian. And this isn't something that we just go all in all the way, but baby steps. Maybe this week you think, all right, who is one person I can share with? And we're going to get to this later, but who is one person that I could, you know, I know at work or in my family or my friends that just don't know God? All right, I'm going to spend some time praying for them, spend some time reading scripture for them, and spend some time talking to them about God. This one small step can lead to rejoicing in heaven as a new soul comes. Live sent by God because you are. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your many mercies. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel and the life that it has given us. And we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your work, to be a part of your, your business of grace, Lord. Lord, I ask that you please just allow us to go out into the world and to share your gospel, Lord, to, to preach your message of peace, Lord, and to remain faithful to you, Lord, in submission. Lord, please guide us. Please allow us to go to, go to places, Lord. Bless our conversations, Lord. But Lord, we just thank you so much. Father, please just be with us now as we just respond to you. We humbly pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.